Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host. My friend David Sills is back. David, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing, Harrison? I'm doing really well. I'm waking up. Uh, I got a couple cups of coffee in me, and uh, I, I think we're ready to tackle. Uh, we've been working through deconstruction um, and sort of hopscotching around as you're actually probably listening to this. Uh, but one of the things we're tackling right now are, are sort of common myths that people who are, are wrestling with a deconstruction of their faith sort of latch onto, right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we ta- we've talked a couple times about deconstruction and how a lot of the times it can be healthy. Um, I think it's easy to look at deconstruction from if, if it's something where you've never struggled with and say, oh, well, these people are just not trusting scripture. They're they're idolizing their own ideas and all this stuff. But I think, um, you know, Jesus heart toward deconstruction when John the Baptist had doubts and he sent messengers to him saying, hey, are you actually the Messiah? Because this wasn't what I thought the Messiah looked like. <laughs> Jesus didn't scold him. He didn't make an example of him. He did miracles that were fulfillment of prophecy in Isaiah. And he said, go tell John what you've seen and heard. He gave him the reassurance he needed. And then Mm -hmm. he turns to the crowd and he says, look, John is the greatest among men. You know, he he praises John. So it's not like you can't have doubts and struggles and questions, you know, because what happens is we all get through places in life where what, what we've been believing and the way we've been conceptualizing life no longer fits because we have new experiences or a new perspective is put on us. And if Christianity is true, if the message of, if Jesus really is God, we've talked about evidence for that in, you know, previous episodes last year, if Jesus really is God, then his message will hold water and his heart and his truth will, will be the stuff that really gives life and, and stands up to scrutiny. So we can have confidence in that, but it may be that our ideas have to change. And it's not that maybe our ideas were completely wrong, but maybe they were partially correct, or maybe they were incomplete, or maybe they were kind of simplistic and mm-hmm. leaning into the nuance. And, um, you know, maybe there are things that I misunderstood. I think that's, that's where deconstruction can be healthy. I, and and I mean I think it's actually one of those things where uh, when we when we've looked at these myths and we kind of talked about them you sent me uh, uh, some stuff to go over before we started recording uh, all this this series there's at least a little bit to latch on to in mm-hmm. every single one of these myths and, and like you can see where the devil then would would whisper and and anxiety would worry and, and these things can be built up which is why when we sort of deal with them we can actually sort of predict the myths because we we do actually sort of have pretty common issues with it. And and in the same way that Jesus wasn't sort of surprised by John the Baptist doubt. I mean, after all, he was the alpha, he'll be the omega. Um, he's, he's, he's seen everybody's doubt from Adam all the way into uh, the last great day. He, he always deals with it sort of the same way. And it's going to let us confront this next myth too, I, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So we've been talking about things. And I think the thing you said is important is that these myths are not entirely false. There's a kernel of truth in them. And so the myth I want to talk, last time we talked about, you know, is Christianity just fire insurance? It's about getting your sins forgiven so you don't go to hell. And we kind of talked about how salvation is much more holistic than just kind of this legal transaction between us and God. And that it's really about a relationship and and knowing God is our heavenly father who loves us and who delights in us and how that's so life-giving. Related to that is, you know, a myth we can talk about this time, which is that God hates certain people. And I say certain people, but we can fill in the blank. In this um, day and age, it's always gender stuff or, or sexuality stuff. It, it's LGBTQIA. It's, it's it transgender. Could, yeah. It could. And, you know, and unfortunately, these days, it spills into other things like politics. It could spill uh-huh. into social issues. Um, yeah. So it's our, you know, it's no secret that our society is polarized. And when Christians lean into the polarization, it looks like, well, if Christians appear to hate certain people or they're not generous towards certain people, then maybe that's God's perspective too. And that's really a tragedy that people who are following Jesus are totally misrepresenting him by othering people and putting them down and saying, wow, you're less than because you think X or you do Y, when that's not the heart of Jesus at all. So yeah, there's this kernel of truth where sometimes there are behaviors that Christians exhibit that do not give the impression that God would give. 
Right. And and I think the Christian's behavior is actually easier to untangle than God's, um, even though ours is sort of wrapped up in in sin. When when Christians express hate, um, more often than not, it's easier if God hates the things that we hate too. So we love to label everything that I am upset with something that God cannot stand either um, and, and stir it up. But also it's, it's easier for self-justification because um, if you sin just like I sin, I can relate to you because I never want to condemn myself and I'll give you, I'll give you the past. But if you sin differently than me, well, that makes me look better. Um, it, it's easy to sort of grab the kinds of sins that you're not guilty of and use them to to elevate yourself, to make yourself look better, less sinful. And our Lord has no patience for that, quite frankly. But but yeah. when it comes to how our Lord expresses uh, uh, his his uh, well his feelings, his thoughts uh, towards sinners, it's it's a little bit more complex because he can do a thing that that we can't do. Uh, he he can love it just just purely, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, you know, and this relates to the stuff we talked about identity last time. And I think as Christians, um, as people, I'll say as people, religious people of any stripe, spiritual people, political people of any type, it, it's easy to put your identity in something other than God's unconditional love for you. And as soon as you put your identity in something other than God's grace, it gives you a standard by which to measure yourself and to measure other people. And like you said, the more I can make myself feel better than other people, the more I feel like, oh, I'm doing all right. My identity is secure, but that's that's not the way it works in God's kingdom. When Jesus walked the earth, he broke down those barriers. He said, listen, you all have identity problems because you all have a relationship problem with God, which is where your identity is meant to come from. And he was very critical of religious people who who were very, very um, uptight about the rules, but missed God's heart underneath that, which is that, um, you know, God is for us. God, um, and it, he may not condone all our behavior, but he's for us and he's for our hearts and he wants what's best for us. Um, and that's, um, you know, I think that's often missed when we talk about these things. Right. And, and it really starts to shape these things, too, because I, I, I mean, well, if, if Christians are going to only sort of address other people that are wrong, it, it very much changes, not just sort of people's perception of, of the church, but even even of God. Right. Yeah, there's this um, I've said this on a podcast with um, another pastor that my perception of American Christianity is that if you were to pick five people off the street, you know, not, not, not necessarily religious, just just five people off the street at random. And you were to ask, what do you, what are, what's the Christian stance, you know, toward life? You know, what, 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 what do Christians represent? What are their beliefs? My guess is people could name three things off the top of your head that Christians are against. But if you ask them, well, what are Christians for? They might scratch their heads and be like, uh, I'm, I don't actually know, maybe getting to heaven. I mean, maybe, maybe good behavior. Um, I don't know. And I, and I think there's this thing that has happened where because of culture wars, and honestly, I think we need to let go of culture wars yeah. a little bit because I don't think politics is where these things happen. I don't think Jesus at this point is going to move through politics as much as through individual relationships and just, just loving people. Um, but I think because of the culture wars, I think people associate Christians with stances against certain behaviors. And again, are those the only behaviors that Jesus was against? No, he was against behaviors that all of us commit. He was against sin. You know, he was an equal opportunity discriminator, so to, so to speak. He was like, you know what? You're all all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody's broken, and that brokenness comes out in different ways. But I think, you know, capturing what are what are Christians for? What is the message of Jesus? that is God for us and having that be the first thing people think of when they think of that's what Christianity is. I think, you know, we have a lot of work to do in the American church to bring ourselves into alignment with the way Jesus did his ministry. Right. Cause there's two things there. I mean, first the recognition that it, the, the church was here before the political kingdom you think will fix all your problems. And unless the Lord returns, the church will be here after the political system you think will fix all of your problems falls. Um, but but also, if if there is a, a God who who works in a way that is not of this world, then maybe we can find a way to to address sinners who are still sinners without excusing their sin, but actually actually forgiving it. And this is something that, that Christ chiefly does. Um, he, he never actually says, well, you know, 
your sin doesn't matter so much because I love you, but but rather he he takes it specifically right to the cross. Um, it, it's it's the simplest question of does God hate somebody? Um, it measured in his own death. Is there anybody that Jesus did not die for? Well, then no, he, he doesn't hate you full stop. But, but that cross has effects. It even has effects backwards through, through Jesus own ministry. Uh, but, but looking at this through, through the cross, it, it means that you're allowed to address sin, not as something that, that labels you anymore because Jesus takes your sin away. Yeah, I think there are a number of things there. And I really like what you said about the cross affecting backward through Jesus ministry. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He had his eyes mm -hmm. on the cross and empty tomb, his whole ministry and everything was leading up to that. And because he knew that he was going to pay the penalty for sin in order to reconcile people to God, he was able to relate to people in a way that was very, very shocking. Um, and I think, you know, there, there was a sermon I recently heard at a vineyard church here in Ohio where, um, you know, they talked about the the second article of the creed, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Um, and they talked about the deity of Jesus and they said, you know, an academic question is, is Jesus God? And, you know, you and I have talked about, you know, the evidence for that um, in previous episodes, but they said a heart question that's equally as important is, is God exactly like Jesus? Because if Jesus is the portrait of God, that means when we look at how Jesus interacted with people, we see how God interacts with people. When we look at how Jesus felt about people, we see how God feels about people. And now there are a couple things I notice when I look at Jesus' ministry that he did in interacting with people because of the fact that he had the cross as his destination. And one of the things is... Um, you know, like you said, we like to sanitize certain sins and say, well, those are like me, so they're not as bad. And these other sins, they're not like me, so they're really bad. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus, um, you know, he said, if before you criticize the, the speck in your brother's eye, look at the log in your own eye. You know, he kind of said, take a look in the mirror before you criticize someone else. Come mm -hmm. to grips with your own sin. Um, but then he went, he, when you look at the people Jesus hung out with, and I think this is such a contrast to the way people perceive, rightly perceive the American church today. Jesus hung out with the people that everybody said were beyond saving. Jesus hung out with um, tax collectors and prostitutes. Now, so that, that, you know, that's like, okay, tax collectors, I don't hate the IRS. I mean, they're annoying, but they're not bad people. They're just doing their job. So let's take tax collectors and, and sinners, the lingo that was put, and let's translate it to our own day. If Jesus were here today in the United States, visiting the American church in the United States of America, who would he hang out with? You know, I think on the list, we would have rapists, white collar thieves, people who committed high dollar fraud. Um, pedophiles, um, terrorists, you know, Jesus actually hung out with terrorists. He had a terrorist as his disciple. Um, are we uncomfortable yet as Christians? Are we getting to starting to squirm in our yeah, seats? Jesus hangs out with those people. Yeah, because the point is, it's not us versus them. Jesus doesn't look and say, these people are worse than he sees. You, you all are broken. You all need me. And because he knew he was going to the cross, he said, listen, I want to have a relationship. And he goes to the farthest lengths to reach each of us, none of us, no matter what we've done is beyond saving. And Jesus gravitated toward the people that knew they were on the outside, that knew they what, what they were doing was unacceptable, that they, they knew what the rules were. They didn't, mm -hmm. they, you know, they were living in a Jewish society. It was beat upon them from early on in their youth. They didn't have to question that. What they did question was, am I still lovable by God because of this thing? And Jesus broke right through that and said, yeah. I, I want to hang out with you. I want to have dinner with you. I want to party with you. You know, I want to, I want to be friends with you. And I think that's something that uh, it's very hard to do to hang out with people who are different than you, but that is mm -hmm. what Jesus has called us to. And that is something we need to capture in the heart of the church again. And part of it is so challenging is because we want to work forward from that point instead of backward from the cross. We want to work forward from Jesus just wants to party with uh, the, 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 the most sinful of sinners. And, and that makes us uncomfortable because our Lord also very clearly in his word tells us to flee from sin. Uh, he, he actually speaks in, in ways that, that um, are, are 
very black and white to Christians, but we start with this idea that Jesus wants to to just hang out with the sinners. And pretty soon we have a Jesus who simply affirms us in the lost area that we already are in. And it offers nothing, an affirmation to the lost never actually helps them be found. Um, it, it really doesn't. Uh, it, it doesn't address the, the issues of anxiety, of depression, of guilt, of shame, of, of, of death itself. Um, and so rather, when, when we are told Jesus dined with sinners, it's because Jesus actually wants to be the meal for sinners. He invites us to, to eat and drink his body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And so in the same way that Jesus worked back from the cross, we have to work forward to it uh, from Jesus spending time with sinners because it it's so easy to then say, well, so you, you just, you don't believe in the law. Well, no, I, I believe that this is going to kill all of us, you, me, everybody. And so the, 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 the simplest thing here is if you're going to die, partake of the meal of life. And and here then we, we have a Jesus who you're right, is, is never afraid to be seen with somebody, never afraid to love somebody, but has a, a love that is willing to drive past simply, have you gotten better at this thing yet before I can I can spend time with you? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think you're, you're getting at something that I know um, I learned from my parents. Um, they did, they modeled this really well. And I think it's easy to get stuck on people's behavior and mm -hmm. to say, well, this behavior isn't something that I like and to miss people's hearts. And the fact of the matter is a lot of our behavior, all of our behaviors are driven by heart needs. And until those heart needs are met, the behaviors are going to stay until we find something that works better. Um, and so I think, you know, I think of when Jesus interacted with this woman who was a social outcast. She wasn't a Jew. She was, you know, she was shunned by Jews racially um, and religiously. She was a Samaritan. Um, and she's, she's out getting water in the middle of the day, which is not a time you do it because she was avoiding everyone because nobody liked her. Nobody liked her because she was, she had bad behavior. She was immoral. And Jesus calls her out, so to speak, not to condemn her. He's, he says, he doesn't call her out. He gets her attention because she's kind of like talking to him like he's this man. He wants to kind of get her to see, hey, I am the Messiah. So he says, yeah, I know something about you. You've had five husbands and the one you have is not now your husband. But then he doesn't say, hey, let's fix the behavior. And he doesn't say that, you know, that this is the, this is this barrier between you and me. He says, he goes on, he says, hey, let's talk about um, how I am the thing, the, the water that will never leave you thirsty. I'm the thing that satisfies your spiritual longing and longings in a way nothing else can. And I think, you know, it's important not to get stuck on behavior because the fact of the matter is, um, who doesn't, like we all struggle with behaviors that we're like, yeah, I wish I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, that and it doesn't diminish it, but it also doesn't require you to be your own savior. And, and that's the, the distinction here is, is Jesus offers her the water of life so she would never thirst again in the same way that you are offered a, a, a salvation that is not dependent on you never sinning again. You're going to sin this week and you're going to sin next week and until you die or Christ comes back. Every church service starts with the forgiveness of sins. And so we just want that to, to be offered to, to all people. Um, it, it, salvation for, for LGBTQ is, is not contingent on you not being a sinner anymore. It's, it's contingent on Jesus offering the water of life in, in baptism. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the, the thing that I think helps in all this is, you know, is God forgiving me because he hates me? Or is God forgiving me for another reason? And I think, you know, it all gets back because we could talk about forgiveness and all that, but forgiveness sometimes can have this implicit sense of shame. Like, yeah, mm. I'm legally forgiven, but I'm dirt. And I think we mm. all struggle with this in different areas. And I think there's this aspect of what is God's attitude toward me? Is he, is, is Jesus kind of saying, oh, you got to forgive this guy. I know you don't want to God, but God, the father, but you have to. Or is God, you know, God's the one who sent Jesus. He said, I want to forgive these people. I want to bear the pain so they don't have to. So, you know, to kind of circle around to the beginning, does God hate certain people? Like God adores people. He wants them with him. He wants what's best for them. And I think if we, if we model that as Christians, it'll change the tone around these conversations if we live it out. Because, you know, rather than saying what we're against as a primary thing that we believe, I think we have to capture that the gospel is about God for us. It's about God coming to save the broken places in the world, setting things right, giving us wholeness and peace and joy. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's got to be the thing because it's, it's, it's about God for us. God loves us. Right, and that for us actually addresses the against us better than than your your own personal rage or hate. Um, the, the for us actually forgives the sin. 
and, and that's what we're about here. Um, if, if God is for us, then God is willing to do something about the things that set us against him. And, uh-huh. and that's where he goes to the cross. And he doesn't go for the ones who have, have managed to kick their sin. He, he goes for the ones who don't even understand it yet, who are, who are still wrestling with it. And he's never content. He, he always calls us flee from sin, but also my my cross, my death, my resurrection is the thing that saves you and never, ever take your eyes off that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. David, thank you so much for hanging out. This was a, an important one. Yep. All right. Thanks, Harrison. Have a good one. Okay. You too.